Today is Monday, September 21st, 2020, and today I'm thinking about doing things that are pretty difficult, but you know that it's the right thing to do, so you just have to do it anyways. John chapter 14, verses 11 through 20. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And the main thing that I wanted to point out here was this verse 11, and I talked about this in my NPC video. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. There are some things, especially things that Jesus told us, that are a little hard to, I guess, understand or to apply to our lives. And just because something's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. I mean, I think this is just a known thing about life. People know that a lot of things in life that are good for you and that are that you know it's the right thing, it's harder than just sticking your head in the sand and pretending nothing's going on and just doing nothing. That's easy. But a lot of times doing the right thing is a little bit harder. And here I think Jesus is just talking about more about faith-based. Sometimes you just have to believe something and not fully understand it. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So it's important that we believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, even if we don't understand all the intricacies of, of how it all works. That's what I take this as. And yeah, here I think that Jesus is talking more of a, a faith-based, sometimes you just got to believe in something and go with it. And if, if what that belief is, is a belief in Jesus Christ and what he tells us, I think that's going to be a good thing. And here's the particular thing that I'm thinking of when it comes to this. Sometimes you just got to do it. And this is something that I have to force myself to do it. It's not easy. I still don't know that I'm even good at doing this. But it's loving your enemies, praying for your enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This is one of those things that you just got to do it. And it's not easy. And in the beginning, I definitely felt like a fake it till you make it. I had no idea what it meant to pray for my enemies, and I still don't think that I do a good job of it necessarily, but I'm getting better. And if I never just forced myself to do it to begin with, I don't think that I would have grown at all in that, in my ability to pray for my enemies. And so yeah, that's what this video is about. Here, Here's a better example of a practical way to apply kind of the just do it idea to faith. And that's in take the things that Jesus told us that are harder to do, but nonetheless, he told us to do it and you just got to do it. And this is one of those things. You just got to pray for your enemies. It's easy to sit here and pray, oh, save my family, Jesus. That's really easy. Everybody does that. You know, even people that aren't religious, in certain moments, they'll they'll pray for their family and all that stuff. But it's hard to pray for your enemies. And it's even harder to pray for your enemies and really feel it, to truly feel what you're saying. And that's where I think just doing it, kind of faking it till you make it, praying for your enemies, 
Now, you can't do it forever. You can't fake it forever and just be totally phony about the whole thing. But how are you going to get better at praying for your enemies if you just never do it to begin with because you just never try? So I think that this is a good practical... If you're looking for something to do, faith-based, that you're, you're, you just want to do it, let's just go, go for it and do it. Try thinking of some enemies of yours and praying for them. And it might feel a little phony to begin with, but the more and more you do it, you might actually start to think of ways to actually pray for them and in meaningful ways. I can just say, so I'll just talk very briefly about myself, just because I know that there's certain things in your life that you think back and you regret all those things and inevitably other people are going to be involved in those bad memories that you have. And the more I pray for my enemies and all that, I just get better perspective. I stop blaming people for things that aren't really their fault. It's easy to look back at, at things in our life and things that we regret and you shift the blame to these other people that you despise. And if you can turn your perspective around and actually care for those people and just do your best to pray for them, I think it helps you take responsibility for the things that you are responsible for and you stop just shifting the blame to all your enemies all the time. So Matthew chapter 5, this is the Beatitudes. We'll just read, read the Beatitudes until we get to the end one. Matthew chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And this last one is kind of what this video is talking about. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you can't forgive your enemies for what they did to you, then why do you expect to be forgiven for the things that you did against God? And briefly, I want to bash on the NIV version. I always do that. NIV, V already has version in it. Here, I just want to bash on the NIV for a little bit. Look how ugly this is. Look how ugly the NIV is and how all the... All the little marks everywhere, the A, the B, the C, there's little footnotes on every little thing. It really does remind me of Shakespeare. If you go grab a Shakespeare novel or play or whatever, and you try to read it, it's filled with all these little numbers and letters in the margins. That's not readable. Look how confusing this is. Look how ugly this is. This is the NIV, and they... So I guess just the point I'm trying to make with this, it doesn't really fit with the video, but I think it's very important that nobody reads NIV and that everybody's reading KJV. What about this is easier to read with all these things in the margins? And a lot of times, the footnotes that they have undermine the Bible itself. There are all sorts of footnotes that are like, well, this verse doesn't exist in this version, and this verse is translated this other way in this version. It's sowing confusion. And just look at, I mean, all you have to do is look at this and see how littered it is with all these different footnotes and all that. The Bible tells us not to add anything to the Bible. This is Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter in the Bible. I always point out how the very first page in a book and the very last page in a book are so important. I'm, I'm the kind of person when I'm reading I'm always kind of looking at the next page, so I always hate it when I'm reading a novel and you can see something fancy going on on the next page. I just can't help it. I skip forward and I start reading what's going on over there. Same thing, oftentimes I'll go ahead and read the last page of a book just because I want to know what's going on. And the Bible, the very first page is very important of the Bible. And notice it's something that most churches just totally tell you that it's fantasy, even though it's the truth. Genesis 1 is super important. And similarly, Revelation chapter 22 is very important. It's the very last page of the, of the Bible, the very last chapter. So verses 18 through 21. For, te for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, 
God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so here there are punishments for adding to the Bible and removing from the Bible. And look at all this stuff that's being added. These people better be 100% certain that they're being guided by the Holy Ghost to put all these... Uh, do you see what I'm getting at? How, how can these people be sure that all of these little footmarks are inspired by God? And also the NIV removes a bunch of stuff. So to me, it's just that's blatantly obvious that the NIV breaks all of these things going on. On, at the end of Revelation. They're adding all sorts of footnotes. They're removing things. They're sowing confusion by putting little footnotes that say, well, this doesn't exist in this version. Anyway, so that's my anti-NIV rant, and we'll get back to the topic now. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, very important part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You can't expect to have your debts forgiven if you're still holding grudges against a bunch of people. The best thing to do for your enemies is to pray for them. And I know that that's not an easy thing to do, but I think it's one of the, the best things to apply this. You just got to do it sometimes. Just try praying for your enemies and maybe just do it once a day. And I'll just tell you that at the beginning, I didn't even know what to do a lot of times. I would just, you know, just in the same way that when somebody leaves me a comment and I just try to think, you know, God bless that person. And I just try to have that thought. Start there. Start easy. And maybe you'll start to get more specific things that you can pray for. For your enemies. I'll end with this. Luke chapter 14 verses 12 through 14. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I guess I still have one more verse. Luke chapter 5, verse 31. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. God bless everyone.